Good morning, church. That's me just driving our sound person nuts with that crackling there. Apologies for that. One of my favorite lines in that song that we have just sung, you maybe have heard this before, if you've ever wondered, what does that uh, line mean? One little word shall fell him. And when Martin Luther was writing that hymn, he had in mind what Jesus said in John's Gospel when he was dying, and he said, it is finished. And that is one word in the original language, in the Greek language. And so that's what he had in mind. One little word shall undo, destroy the works of the devil, and pay for our sin, and in Jesus rising from the dead, as we sung about, shall accomplish our resurrection. And so we have uh, every hope and confidence in the face of the kingdom of darkness that the kingdom of light does indeed triumph. So thank you for leading us in those songs and other ways, uh, uh, those of you who have. Before I begin this morning, I want to just give you a little bit of a report that um, this past Wednesday morning, I sat down with some brothers, uh, Pastor uh, Roger Pasco, who was among us as a pastor, he's here this morning uh, with Jan and uh, Bob McGregor from Grandview Baptist Church in Kitchener, and then Sean Simons from Fellowship Baptist Church in New Hamburg. We sat down with Caleb for a pre-ordination council, sort of uh, these men having a first crack at his statement. And uh, I don't think he's in the room, so I can I can talk about him, and his head won't swell. But um, it was it, he did. I thought he did incredibly well, and uh, so. Uh, your prayers for him were answered. His statement is excellent. He'll tell you, oh, I got to sand some rough edges off. And okay, sure, yeah, sure, there's always room for improvement. But um, one brother said they think it's one of the best ordination statements that they've ever seen. And so we're thankful for Caleb and for the work that he's done. We see his progress in the faith and so encourage him this morning uh, as he anticipates his full ordination council. With all of the churches in our region uh, invited to attend, they can send up to three messengers. Uh, so Caleb will be doing that on April 6th. Brian will shortly follow. So do keep these brothers in your prayers as they go through that process. And uh, we rejoice in the, the steps that they've taken so far. At some point in the life of a Christian or in the life of a church, God's people will find themselves looking around, maybe in despair or in anger or frustration, at this never-ceasing conundrum. Wicked people prosper. They do. In small ways and big ways, evil people don't just seem to get away with all sorts of injustice and unrighteousness. They seem to benefit from it. And when this happens in our personal lives, in a, in a community, when this happens nationally, when this happens internationally, it's deeply unsettling. The wicked prosper. For the people of God, this is not a new experience. And we know this because God, in his inscrutable wisdom and matchless grace, has actually given us words to use to speak to him when we're disoriented by this painful reversal of the wicked prospering. This is not our sermon text for this morning, but it serves well to introduce the theme we'll encounter. So just listen as I read these words from Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Why is the psalmist saying this? For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have, they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace, violence covers them as a garment. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? And the psalmist says, behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. The psalmist is groaning because the wicked are not. And he's disoriented. Because 
it seems like living for Yahweh has been a complete and utter waste of time. It's bitter. And he's starting to wonder, where are you, God? He's starting to ponder, if I can't beat them, maybe I should just join them. I wonder if you've ever had thoughts like that when you've been cheated or deceived. When you've suffered loss at the hands of some elaborate scam that robs you of money. Or some predatory individual who robbed you of something far more valuable. Your dignity or your voice. Exposure to such wickedness is deeply disturbing and it's deeply disorienting. The psalmist knew, and again, God has given us words because he wants us to know how to speak to him when this happens, which it has and it does and it will. But he doesn't just teach us how to pray when our lives are turned upside down by wicked people. He shows us what it looks like when he shows up in the middle of situations where the wicked have prospered for a very long time. And when he does, as in our passage this morning, we can conclude with certainty, the wicked will not prosper forever. God will curse those who curse us, and he will bless us in the process. Human beings won't get away with opposing him and those he loves forever because Yahweh has promised to give his people his kingdom through covenant. He is against those who are against his covenant people and he is for those who are for his covenant people, which means the wicked will not prosper forever because God will curse those who curse us and he will bless us in the process. And for the Christian, I hope that this provides a deep sigh of Relief for the soul that may be in angst because of wicked individuals. God is jealous for those who are his and he will protect them. And for anyone who is listening who is not a Christian, there's a double-edged sword here. On the one hand, I hope you are drawn to this only true God because he, because he satisfies what seems to be an inherent desire for justice that he has put within us. This is a good thing. Yet on the other hand, any desire we have for God to mete out justice toward the wicked forces us to look in the mirror because it means he will be just towards us as well. There's no doubt that we are the victims of the sinful acts of others. We can't live long in this world and not experience that. But there's also no doubt that others are the victims of our own sinful acts. We are not exempt from God's judgment of the wicked. So what then should we do? Keep listening for the solution. I'll come back to this a little bit later on. But for now, why don't you turn with me to Genesis chapter 30 which is our text for this morning. Genesis 30 into Genesis 31. I'm ignoring chapter verse divisions again because of what seems to fit the flow of the author. Again, the chapter and and verses were added later as a, a guide to help us find our way around, but they're not part of the original text, and so it's okay if we just set those aside as we study God's Word. So Genesis chapter 30 beginning in verse 25, is page 24 of these blue Bibles. If you don't have your Bible or you don't have a Bible, you can take and use this and keep it if it's uh, something you don't own. So Genesis chapter 30, beginning in verse 25, we're going to read down to verse 21 of chapter 31. Let's pray before we do that, for we're dealing with God's Word and we need His help. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the ordinary means of grace that we are able to avail ourselves of this morning. We have sung psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in our hearts, making melody to you, but at the same time admonishing one another, teaching, instructing, as we hear the sound of our brothers and sisters singing in our ears and uh, compelling us to 
believe and trust in the truth of who you are as we've uh, declared publicly. We have this gracious gift of prayer that we can avail ourselves of and we do so even now. We have heard your word read to us, which is a light to our feet, a lamp to our path, and now we come to the preaching of your word. And I pray that you would indeed bless this means of grace to us, Lord, that we would hear what you would say by your spirit, through your word, to our church this day. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 30, verse 25. As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go. For you know the service that I have given you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, What shall I give you? Jacob said, You shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Laban said, Good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. Then, this is about to get a little bit strange. I'll explain it when we get to it. Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks, and so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants, and camels and donkeys. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's he has gained all this wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was, and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, the spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock bore spotted. And if he said, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled, for I have seen All that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. And Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, 
Is there any portion of, or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away, that doesn't mean he chased away, it just means he shepherded them. He drove away all his livestock, all his property that he had gained, the livestock in his possession that he had acquired in Padan Aram to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods, and Jacob tripped, tricked Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee. He fled with all that he had and arose and crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. This, brothers and sisters, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as was mentioned last week, just tying together what came before with what we've just read, God's remembrance of Rachel in Genesis 30, 22, triggers events that lead to Jacob's deliverance from his wicked uncle Laban back to the land of promise that God said he would give to him and to his now numerous offspring. And now that Jacob has 11 sons and one daughter, which is God's stunning grace, shining forth against the backdrop of the scandalous sins of the birth war between Leah and Rachel, after all of this, Jacob's people and his country, they're calling, he wants to go home. But while God has blessed him with a large family, At this point, he's entirely dependent on his greedy snake of an uncle, whose name ironically means white, yet who is far from pure. Jacob has a lot of mouths to feed. My dad grew up with 11 siblings. I've heard the stories. He's got a lot of futures to plan for, and so he needs to extricate himself from his uncle's wicked clutches. Laban is a piece of work, and Jacob needs out. So he goes to him which marks the beginning of a change in Jacob. And he says in verse 25, Send me away, that I may go to my home and my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go, for you know the service that I have given you. Now Laban was born, but it wasn't yesterday, so he responds craftily to Jacob in verse 27, and he says, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. And here is where we begin to see the downfall of Laban as God curses him and blesses Jacob in the process. We are confident that the wicked will not prosper forever because God blesses us with wisdom and knowledge that thwarts them and prospers us. God will curse those who curse us and bless us in the process. The wicked won't prosper forever because God blesses us with wisdom and knowledge that thwarts them and prospers us. And before we post-game analyze this interaction between Jacob and Laban, which we'll do, we have to keep in mind what's going on beneath the surface. The portion that we read in Genesis 31, verses 10 to 12, which is the dream that God gives to Jacob, that takes us behind the curtain of what happens in Genesis 30. So as we work our way through Genesis 30, we have to keep in mind the dream of Genesis 31, which explains everything that's happening. Yahweh showed Jacob in a dream how Jacob would plunder Laban. And so he's equipped with this knowledge, there's there's a wisdom that comes from the Lord. The Lord has given this to Jacob, all that he needs to leave, not only with this huge family, but with material wealth. And so equipped with this, Yahweh has blessed Jacob with knowledge and wisdom to cut through Laban's never-ending schemes. Notice in Laban's response what manipulative people do in verse 27. They flatter. If I have found favor in your sight, Laban is painting Jacob as the superior and Laban as the inferior. He's flattering him. He's trying to butter him up. 
And manipulative people also provide a kernel of truth to try and reel you in. Yahweh has blessed me because of you. It's true. Laban sounds godly on the surface, but he claims to have acquired this knowledge by forbidden means of divination, which is an abomination in the Scriptures. In and of itself, this is a surprising acknowledgement of Laban's, which Jacob wisely reinforces in verse 30. And what we see here is that Laban is a man who loves the fruit of Yahweh's covenant blessings, but he wants nothing to do with the root of Yahweh's covenant blessings. I've met people like this. You've met people like this. Maybe you are someone like this yourself. There are people in our lives and our world who love some of the outcomes of Christianity. Who love some of the influence of Christianity. Who will even praise aspects of the Christian life and long for it themselves, but they will want absolutely nothing to do with Jesus Christ. The other day, our three-year-old was watching the new Paw Patrol movie which means nap for mom and dad. But I was with it at the end enough to catch the climax of the story. If you don't know what Paw Patrol is, they're just animated puppies. We'll just go with that, okay? These puppies are given the key to the city at the end of the movie because they looked out for not their own interests, but the interests of others. It's almost a direct quote from the movie. What a wonderful thing to teach to children this biblical truth. But it won't amount to anything unless it's rooted in the transformative power of the new life in Christ who is the ultimate expression of this in his incarnation and his crucifixion. In other realms, people want healthy marriages and great relationships with their children and honesty and integrity in the workplace. These are all good things. They're all taught in Scripture, but they cannot be severed from the root. Laban is an illustration of what Francis Schaeffer once called a cut flower culture. When you remove a rose from a bush and you put it in a vase, you can enjoy its beauty and its fragrance for some time. But because it is severed from the root that gives life, it will wither and it will die. Jacob is in covenant relationship with Yahweh. And Laban benefits by his close proximity to Jacob. But Laban only wants the material blessings he can get from Yahweh through Jacob. He doesn't want anything else. He wants nothing to do with Yahweh himself. And now this cut flower that Laban has enjoyed is about to wilt before his very eyes. And there's nothing he can do about it. Because God has blessed Jacob with wisdom and insight that will thwart Laban, who in his wickedness cannot and will not prosper forever. His greedy heart is still on display, even with this admission of Yahweh's blessing through Jacob, when he says in verse 28, Name your wages and I will give it. Laban doesn't think he owes Jacob anything. Jacob worked for seven years for Rachel, He was deceptively given Leah instead. Then he worked for another seven years for Rachel for real this time. And these were the agreed upon terms. Two daughters, two wives, seven years each. That's what you have, Jacob. What else do I owe you? Nothing. He's backing Jacob into a corner. Laban won't go down without a fight. Jacob presses him in verses 29 and 30. He says, you yourself know how I have served you. And how your livestock has fared with me. You had little before I came And it has increased abundantly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I put my foot, literally is what the the translation is. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? In other words, Jacob's saying, I've worked for you for years, man. Don't you care at all for your own daughters and your own grandchildren? Laban is an ungrateful, greedy swine. But he seems to crack a little and he asks Jacob in verse 31, what shall I give you? And what Jacob says next is absolutely brilliant. As Abraham would take nothing from the king of Sodom, so the king of Sodom couldn't come and later say, I made you rich. Jacob will take nothing from his wicked uncle that he does not earn himself. And he makes the cheapskate an offer he can't refuse in verses 31 to 34 that warrants a little bit of explanation. Most sheep are white and most goats are dark. You probably didn't know that because there aren't a lot of shepherds in our midst and there aren't a lot of sheep fields around us. I grew up across the street from 
a field of sheep. I lived in Scotland. There were sheep everywhere. I still really know nothing about them. So this is as much for me as it is for you. But most sheep are white. Most goats are dark. And Jacob is proposing to Laban that as he continues to work as a shepherd, he'll only take the hybrids. He'll take the dark lambs among the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats. And there were two upsides to this for Laban. First, it would be really easy visually to make sure Jacob wasn't cheating. Because he could just like, this is a white sheep and this is a dark goat, that's mine. This is a dark sheep and this is a spotted or speckled goat, that's yours. It's very easy. So Jacob couldn't cheat or steal. Second, because most sheep were white and most goats were dark, this would hardly touch Laban's bottom line. Shepherds would typically receive about 20% of the flock as their wages. But what Jacob is proposing under normal circumstances is way less than 20%. And so in verse 34, Laban's laughing all the way to the bank. Good, he says. Let it be according to your word. Yet Jacob has Laban right where he wants him because remember, Yahweh has shown him in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. And he's equipped with this knowledge and with wise negotiating tactics, Laban is about to get his comeuppance. But not before making us angrier first. This vile man, he knows no boundaries. He takes no chances in verses 35 and 36. And he removes all of the striped and spotted animals and every lamb that was black. And he puts a three-day journey between his sons and between Jacob. He stacks the deck against Jacob, making his life as difficult as possible, which is what wicked, manipulative, hungry, money-hungry schemers do. But Laban's laugh is going to catch in his own throat. Rest assured, the wicked will not prosper forever. We are confident of this, not only because God gives us wisdom and knowledge that thwarts the wicked, but also because God can plunder the wicked and prosper us with their riches. God will curse those who curse us, and he will bless us in the process. He provides for his people. The wicked won't prosper forever because God plunders the wicked and prospers us with their riches. That's what we learn from verses 36 to 43 of chapter 30. And I'm not going to spend much time here except for the punch on the punchline in the last verse of the chapter, which says, Thus the man, speaking of Jacob, increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants, camels and donkeys. Jacob is literally loaded by the end of this chapter, which is how Laban's sons describe the matter in Genesis 31.1. The term that's translated there as wealth can mean heavy or weighty, and it's often a term used to describe God's glory. So Jacob is loaded. He's weighted down with all of this material wealth. And so the dream that God gave to Jacob, the second dream now, has come to pass. But it didn't happen by Jacob employing what seems to be a superstitious practice with the sticks in verses 37 to 40. Like, what's with the sticks? Well, the understanding of the day seems to have been that whenever a, whatever an animal was looking at when it was mating would have an influence on the kind of offspring that it would produce. So if the goats and sheep were looking at striped and spotted sticks, they would give birth to striped and spotted kids and lambs. But that's not how Jacob got rich from Laban's flocks. Nor did he get rich by the selective breeding of a skilled shepherd in verses 41 to 42. Jacob spent close to 20 years as a shepherd, and he's able to tell the strong from the weak, and he used that expertise to ensure in verse 42 that the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger was Jacob's. But the dream comes in verse 31 to tell us this was not Jacob's doing. Yahweh did this for Jacob. Which wouldn't be the only time that God would asset strip oppressors of his people for their benefit. In Exodus 12, we read as follows. After 400 years of slavery, the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. They couldn't get rid of the Israelites quick enough because of what Yahweh was doing for them. 
And the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Jacob plunders Laban. The Israelites plunder Egypt. And when the end comes, Babylon the Great is full of merchants and ships and luxurious cloth and food and wine and all of these different types of things. Babylon the Great the city in which was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth will be thrown down in violence. Revelation 17.20 says that in a, uh, sorry, in a single hour her wealth will be laid waste. And Revelation 17.20 says this, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. The wicked will not prosper forever. Whether it's individuals like Laban or oppressive nations like Egypt was to the Israelite people or it's the world system in opposition to God, they will all be robbed of their ill-gotten wealth. And in the end, it is the covenant people of Yahweh who will prosper who will sit down in fine clothing, bright white, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and who will dwell in the New Jerusalem with its streets of gold and its foundations of precious gems and its gates made of single pearls with free access to the tree and water of life. The Lord will do this. We need not fight in our own strength, we need not scheme in our own wisdom as Jacob seems to still be doing. And we certainly need not despair. Yahweh will prosper his people. He will provide for us everything that we need between now and ultimately then. Now with respect to Jacob's uncle, none of this plundering goes over well at all as you can imagine knowing Laban as we do. In Genesis 31, verses 1 to 2, we read as follows. Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has gained all this wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. Literally, Jacob is seeing Laban's face, and Laban's face falls. And Jacob knows he's in trouble. He heard Laban's sons, he saw Laban's face, Laban's cut flower has wilted, but Jacob's garden is in full bloom and he cannot stand it. And the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Evil we have seen manifested in Laban when he had wealth, which raises a serious concern. What is he going to do now? When all of this wealth is slipping through his fingers because of an agreement that he made with Jacob and he can't get out of. I imagine for Jacob, the words of Yahweh in verse 3 are very timely. Enabling us to say with certainty that the wicked won't prosper forever because God blesses us with his presence to protect us from the wicked. He gives us knowledge and insight so that we can thwart the wicked. He plunders the wicked and prospers us instead. And he blesses us with his presence to protect us from the wicked. We keep running into the stunning theme in Genesis, don't we, of God with his people. The Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. Jacob senses at the birth of Joseph that it is time to go. The Lord tells Jacob at the falling of Laban's face that it is definitely time to go. But he need not fear, because as God's people would experience later, Yahweh would go before and would be at Jacob's back. Laban's sons won't lay a finger on Jacob, and neither will Laban. Where God wants his people to go, they will go. When he wants them to go, they will go. 
What God wants his people to have, they will have. And there is absolutely nothing that anyone can do about it. Even the wicked who would bend toward us with evil intent because God himself is with us. I love this line or two from Chris Tomlin's song, Whom Shall I Fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I will be with you, he always says to Jacob. And this is tremendous comfort while we wait for God to mete out justice, which we know isn't always immediate. We're roughly 20 years in here for Jacob and Leah and Rachel. And as Jacob says, he's changed his wages 10 times. Like, I am sick of this. I've had it up to here. Enough is enough. And so the wicked still prosper even to this day. That's why we're disoriented. God hasn't settled all accounts yet, but he will. And if you've been agonizing at points in this Jacob story because of what Laban did to Leah and to Rachel and to Jacob, the relief comes now. The wicked will not prosper forever because God blesses us with justice to settle accounts with the wicked. As Jacob's own grandfather asked, Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Of course he will. The wicked will not prosper forever because God blesses us with justice to settle accounts with the wicked. We hear this in the conversation Jacob has with Rachel and Leah out in the field so that no one can eavesdrop. Jacob knows how quickly things can go south when that happens. Listen to what he says to them in verses 5 and verse 5 and following of Genesis 31. I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before. But the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, which is really quite something, because remember when Jacob moved the stone away from the well by himself, which at least three shepherds couldn't do together? But he says, your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. If you said the spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock bore spotted. And if you said the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. Now there are some remarkable statements here. Verse 5, the God of my father has been with me. Jacob doesn't just believe that God will go with him as he returns to Canaan. Jacob recognizes that the growth of his family and the growth of his wealth are evidence that God has been with him even through all this hardship. And then he says in verse 7, God did not permit him to harm me. Though Laban has inflicted wounds, a blow was upon Jacob, none were death blows. And in the end, because of God's steadfast love and faithfulness, there is an invincibleness to the people of God that the wicked cannot pierce. Yes, they rain their blows down upon us at times, but there are no chinks in God's armor. I believe Paul expresses as much when writing from prison with his execution pending, and he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. And that is where all accounts will be settled, yet sometimes there are tastes of that temporally in the here and the now as we're waiting for the not yet. Jacob says in verse 9, Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. God's presence, God's protection have resulted in what? God's justice. What was Laban's because of Jacob is now Jacob's because of Yahweh. And you can smile here. You can cheer and clap if you like as well. In a way, Rachel and Leah certainly do. Finally, Laban is getting what he deserves. These women who have also suffered at the hands of their wicked father, they can feel the refreshing winds of Yahweh's justice begin to blow on the answer, Jacob, and say to him in verses 14 and 16, is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? That's a hard no. Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, he sold his own daughters. 
to get rich from Jacob's labor. And then they say he has indeed devoured our money. He has eaten it all up. All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. Finally, God has reversed Laban's fortunes in favor of his covenant partner. In fulfillment of the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We dare not get in the way between Yahweh and his covenant people. And we dare not inflict any harm towards God's covenant, faithful covenant son, Jesus. And we dare not get in between Christ and his bride. When Stephen was being stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, the one who ascended to sit at the right hand of God, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. What is he doing? He's on his feet. He's on his feet. Ready to receive Stephen. Ready at the door to come and to judge the living and the dead. As God invited Jacob with another one of these tender, divine pleas in Chapter 31, verse 12, I, I, I wish the translations would capture that. Please lift your eyes, Jacob, and see how this account with your wicked uncle will be settled. And in the same way, we too can lift our eyes in anticipation of the soon coming one who will settle all accounts. As Yahweh affirms to Jacob in the dream in verse 12, I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. None of what happened to Jacob escaped the Lord's notice. Nothing. God is the expert witness in every single case of injustice. For he sees all and he knows all. And his wisdom is inscrutable, rendering unimpeachable judgments. And this is where we return to the double-edged sword that longing for God's justice can be. As I mentioned at the beginning, we should long for it. For to one degree or another, we are all victims of sinful wickedness. People have sinned against us. Some here might have experienced horrendous sins perpetrated against you. And so we should long for justice. We should be angry, righteously so, when there is injustice and evil in our world. But to one degree or another, we are all perpetrators as well. As we cry out for God to act on our behalf, or even on behalf of others, people might be crying out to God because of what we've done to them. So what then? can't expect God to grave on the curve so that only certain wickedness is judged and the rest he just turns a blind eye. Back in 2011, the New York Daily News had this headline following the report of the death of Osama bin Laden. You know what it said? It said, rotten hell. There's that inherent sense of justice coming to the fore. But is it only certain things that God should judge? He would be hardly just if he didn't judge all evil or wickedness, would he? And we can't expect God to accept the currency of our good deeds to pay for the bad. His justice must be satisfied. He can hardly turn a blind eye to some evil because some good has been done. It doesn't do anything with the evil. It doesn't do anything with the wickedness. Nor can we expect God to make an exception for us, which some deluded people think will somehow be the case. Justice for everyone, except for me. If everybody thinks that, then none will be judged, and there would be no justice, and how then would God be fair? So what is the answer? How do we long for the sword of God's justice without the sword of his justice falling upon our own heads? And the answer is found in Romans chapter 3, which says this, For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, all of us. 
and are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That's a 10-gallon word, propitiation. It means that the wrath of God has been satisfied in Jesus Christ and turned, having been turned towards him at the cross is now turned away from the sinner who trusts in the blood of Christ to cover their wickedness and their evil. Paul goes on to say this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So we've all sinned. We're all exposed to the righteous judgment of God. But God was willing to drop the sword of justice on his son, Jesus, who was willing to endure the blow so that justice could be satisfied and sinners could be forgiven. And then forgiven sinners could actually cry out to God that justice be meted out. God is just. And he justifies. He judges the wicked, but he also declares guilty sinners who trust in Jesus innocent. Because Jesus was willing to die on the cross in our place to pay the price that we owed. As John Piper puts it, the wisdom of God devised a way for the love of God to deliver sinners from the wrath of God while not compromising the righteousness of God. So if you are not a Christian, to the cross of Jesus Christ you must turn. We must deal with our own guilt, our own wickedness first before we turn our attention towards the wickedness and guilt of others and ask God to judge that when we are not willing to come to him and have our sin dealt with as it needs to be and covered by the blood of Christ. And if we are already Christians, please do remember this, brothers and sisters. The only reason we have enemies as the covenant people of God is because God made us who were former enemies his friends through the gospel. There's no pride here. There's no arrogance. There ought not to be any self-righteousness whatsoever. The only basis we have to cry out for judgment, for vindication, for victory is grace. The only reason we truly love what is good and hate what is evil is because of what the Lord has done in us. And thanks be to God, this work he begins, he continues so that we do not utterly crumple before wicked people. God blesses us with knowledge and wisdom to thwart the wicked. He provides for his people by plundering the wicked and and, and, uh, providing for us instead. His presence protects us from the wicked. His justice settles accounts with the wicked. And finally, while we wait for the full and final expression of God's justice, we do well to recognize God blessing us with transformation to endure the wicked. God changes us in our encounters with evil people in ways that help us persevere before evil people. The wicked won't prosper forever. And God blesses us with transformation to endure the wicked until the time of his ultimate judgment comes. I'm sure you've noticed by now that the writer of Genesis takes us through some lengthy periods of time of the lives of the patriarchs, sometimes in only a page. You get 20 years in one shot. And because of that, we can more easily see the changes that come about. There's a mother who came to me after last Sunday's sermon, after the passage where Jacob's fathered 12 children by four different women. And she said, why did I name my son Jacob? <laughs> it is a bit ironic that we name, all, we name our children after all of these biblical heroes, and there's not a hero among them, is there? There really isn't. But my response to her was that every time you say his name, you recall the grace of God. Jacob's story doesn't end with his passive participation in the birth war between his two wives, Rachel and Leah. He does not return to Cain in the same man he was when he left. And as he prepares to leave Padanaram, this is a turning point in Jacob's life. He's undergoing transformation. We see it all the way through this narrative. He takes charge with Laban in verse 26. Give me my wives and my children. 
In chapter 31, verse 13, he's called back to the vow that he made when he anointed the pillar that he erected at Bethel. In his speech to his wives, he's recognizing God's presence with him manifested in the blessing of children and wealth. And for the first time in 14 plus years of marriage, his wives are following his lead rather than he following theirs. In verse 17, we see that he obeys God's command from verse 13. Now arise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. And verses 17 to 21, that's exactly what he does. Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away all his livestock. He's a shepherd behind the flock and he's pushing them forward. All his property that he gained, the livestock and his possession that he acquired in Padanaram to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. And presumably Rebecca has died by this point, although there's no mention of it. Now Rachel almost scuttles the whole deal by stealing her father's household gods. And we'll deal with that next week, Lord willing. And Jacob's not all the way transformed because he steals Laban's heart by taking his daughters and his grandchildren without any notice, which just cranks up the tension. What will Laban do in response as the wicked pursue God's covenant people? Nevertheless, Jacob is resolute in following Yahweh's instruction as in verse 21, he fled with all that he had and arose and crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. Jacob is a changing man. A man undergoing transformation. And without this blessing from the Lord, we will cower before the wicked. We will compromise. We will take vengeance into our own hands. We might try to resort to our own cleverness, as Jacob does, with the sticks and the the, the breeding tactics, rather than the way in which God reveals by his word. And we might actually lose sight of Yahweh altogether, which would only make matters far worse. The psalmist we began with knew this too as he reflected on the prospering of the wicked. He too was undergoing transformation that enabled him to endure before evil people. I simply want to let him have the final word. Listen to what he says. All in vain, have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak this way, I would have betrayed the children, the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, he's trying to, how do the, why do the wicked prosper? He says, it seemed to me a wearisome task until until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Let's do that in song together before we leave.